Hi all, in this video we are going to see about factors affecting erythropoiesis. So this question can be asked as a part of an essay question or even as a short essay. So we will see what are the different points that will come under this, this uh, topic factors affecting erythropoiesis. So the most important factor that affects erythropoiesis is the hormonal factors of which the hormone erythropoietin is very important. So we will be dealing uh, with uh, mainly erythropoietin. We will also mention the influence of other hormones like androgens and estrogens on erythropoiesis and about some other hormones that can affect erythropoiesis. Next important factor that affects erythropoiesis is dietary factors and in dietary factors will come the vitamins especially vitamin b12 folic acid and vitamin c then proteins and minerals like iron copper cobalt and nickel and then we also will, will uh, talk about other factors like the intrinsic factor and chemical factors environmental factors and about drugs okay so we'll start one by one and as i said before First, we are going to talk about erythropoietin. So, erythropoietin is a hormone which is secreted especially from the kidneys. Where from the kidneys? It is produced from the interstitial cells in the peritubular capillary bed. Now, it is very important that you know from where in the kidney that erythropoietin is produced. It is in the interstitial cells in the peritubular capillary bed. Now, there is another organ that, has, uh, that produces some amount of erythropoietin which is the liver. So, in the liver, the non-parenchymal cells, especially the kaffir cells and the pedivenous hepatocytes also produce some amount of erythropoietin. But the major source is the kidney itself. So, what stimulates the production of erythropoietin from the kidney? So, the primary stimulus for erythropoietin production is hypoxia. So, whenever there is hypoxia, obviously the renal cell also will be affected by it. So, whenever there is renal cell hypoxia, there will be production of a factor called hypoxia inducible factors, otherwise it's called HIF1. Now, this in turn will act on the DNA or the gene present inside the nucleus. So, we've got an erythropoietin gene and on that gene, we've got a hormone response element. So, whenever there is hypoxia, this hypoxia inducible factor that will act on this hormone response element which is present on the erythropoietin gene. So, the erythropoietin gene will produce erythropoietin and this in turn will act on the precursor cells as well as the progenitor cells of the of erythropoiesis especially the CFUE, colony, colony stimulating factor, colony forming unit, erythroid. So, it acts on the precursor cells of erythropoiesis and thereby speeds up the RBC proliferation so that there will be more RBC production. So, that is how erythropoiesis is stimulated by erythropoietin. So, the major most important stimulus for erythropoietin production is hypoxia. So, what are the functions of erythropoietin or what exactly are the steps that erythropoietin does to increase erythropoiesis or to stimulate erythropoiesis? So, first of all, it encourages the stem cells to the erythroid lineage. So, we know that the hemopoiesis occurs from a pluripotent stem cell. And then we've got committed stem cells which can go either into the myeloid series or into the lymphoid series. And from the myeloid series, certain cells go into the erythroid series. So, erythropoiesis encourages the stem cells towards this erythroid lineage. And in the next step, it can stimulate the BFUE and the CFUE which are the progenitor cells to form the pronomoblast. That means it will enhance the conversion of these progenitor cells to the precursor cells. It reduces the cell cycle length of the precursor cells which means the cells will be able to complete their mitosis faster and, mature and uh, help in the maturation of the cells. It aids in the maturation of the nomoblast. So, this whole thing that is uh, the precursor cells will all be, it reduces the cell cycle and so that they become more and more mature faster. Okay, and it also increases the hemoglobin production in the normoblast and release the immature erythrocytes into the circulation. So here the immature erythrocytes, uh, what, what they mean is mainly the reticulocytes which is the immediate precursor of erythrocytes. So at each step or in every step of erythropoiesis, erythropoietin has got a role and that is how it enhances or increases erythropoiesis. So, what are the other factors that promote or inhibit erythropoietin? So, factors increasing erythropoietin production are factors like hypoxia, 
low blood volume anemia lung diseases and hormones so here you can see that in the first four causes the common uh, pathology is hypoxia itself so I, that is why we say that hypoxia is the most potent stimulus for erythropoietin production and there are factors that decrease the erythropoietin production what are they so some examples are estrogen hormone which decreases erythropoietin production and then we've got adenosine antagonists like theophylline which also decreases erythropoietin production and what about the metabolism so once it is synthesized its usual half life is around 5 hours that means half life means the around say so at around say 10 hours the whole erythropoietin must might be metabolized from the body so what which is the site of inactivation so the inactivation site of erythropoietin is liver so it is produced from the kidney goes in the circulation stimulates all the precursor cells in the bone marrow and then it is finally it uh, finally it reaches the liver where it is metabolized okay so this is the cycle of erythropoietin you can also expect short notes on erythropoietin as such so in that case you can write about these steps that we've just mentioned from what is the source of erythropoietin what is the mechanism of action what is the function what is the uh, how is it, how is it metabolized what are the factors increasing and decreasing erythropoietin production so these these points can be written if erythropoietin as such is short asked as a short essay so we've seen uh, um, in hormonal factors we first seen about erythropoietin before moving on to androgens we will discuss a small physiological basis question so an important question that can be asked is why is there anemia in renal disease i think now you know the answer because we've just uh, discussed about erythropoietin so why is there anemia in renal disease because it is in the kidney that we've got the hormone erythropoietin which in turn will stimulate erythropoiesis so if uh, there is a kidney disease if there is a chronic renal disease what happens is the kidneys are going to shrink and it is going to be less effective so naturally the production of erythropoietin will be affected and thereby it will cause a decrease in erythropoiesis and thus there will be anemia in renal disease so this is a physiological basis question that can be asked so on this note we will move on to the other hormonal factors that is going to affect erythropoiesis so it is the androgens what is androgens do androgen stimulates erythropoiesis okay so that is why there is a higher red cell count in males because androgen stimulates erythropoiesis and what is the mechanism they stimulate erythropoietin production and not only that they can also themselves can directly stimulate erythropoiesis so androgens uh, have a stimulatory effect on erythropoiesis the next hormone that we are going to see is estrogen so what will be the action of estrogen on erythropoiesis See, just now we said androgens stimulate erythropoiesis. So, what will estrogen do? It will inhibit erythropoiesis. There are studies that show that estrogens inhibit erythropoiesis, though the effect is not as pronounced as androgens. So, and how does they, how do they inhibit erythropoiesis? By inhibiting the erythropoietin production and decreases the response of stem cells to erythropoietin. It, uh, it is also mentioned that there is an action to reduce the hepatic globulin synthesis. We know that for hemoglobin we need the globin part also so estrogens can reduce this hepatic globulin synthesis which in turn can affect the synthesis of uh, can affect the erythropoiesis so that is the action of estrogens on erythropoiesis so here again a common uh, physiological basis question that can be asked is why is the rbc count more in males than in females so the common question that we get, uh, the, the common answer that we get from students is because uh, the females have a regular menstrual cycle but unfortunately that is not the answer it is more in males than females because androgens are present in males which stimulate erythropoiesis by stimulating erythropoietin whereas estrogens have an opposite effect to that that is why rbc count is more in males now the other hormones that can affect erythropoiesis is thyroxin again thyroxin also stimulates erythropoiesis by stimulating the erythropoietin production then we've got growth hormone which increases the mitosis and maturation of erythroid precursors cortisol 2 is known to produce mild erythrocytosis so these are the other hormones that can affect erythropoiesis we also have to mention about interleukins here see interleukins have got a very important role to play in erythropoiesis especially interleukin 1 3 and 6 
because they act on the stem cells and convert them into progenitor cells so when you check our uh, on erythropoiesis we can see that at different steps uh, interleukins have got a specific role in determining into what cell they would turn so interleukins 1 3 6 is, is especially important in the erythroid series okay and then we've got this gm csf which is granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor this also stimulates the production of committed stem cells so that would complete our hormonal factors so in factors affecting erythropoiesis we've seen the first part which is hormonal factors in which we said that erythropoietin is the most important one next we'll be moving on to the dietary factors what are the different dietary factors that is involved in erythropoiesis so the first important dietary factor that is uh, required for erythropoiesis is vitamin b12 and folic acid so what do these vitamins have uh, to do in erythropoiesis see for production of dna we need deoxy thymidylate to be converted to dna now from where do we get deoxy thymidylate we get that from deoxy uridylate so in short deoxy uridylate must be converted to deoxy thymidylate for proper dna maturation now for this step we need a compound called 510 methylene tetrahydrofolate so from where do we get this 510 methylene tetrahydrofolate we get it from our dietary folic acid or dietary folate so when we take in folic acid that folic acid is converted to methylene or methyl tetrahydrofolate now this methyl tetrahydrofolate must be converted to its active form which is tetrahydrofolate now this is done by our vitamin b12 so vitamin b12 helps in conversion of the methyl tetrahydrofolate which is in active form to the active tetrahydrofolate so in this process there will be formation of methyl cobalamin and it is this tetrahydrofolate which is being converted to 510 methylene tetrahydrofolate so as you can see there is a interaction between folic acid and vitamin b12 we need dietary folate only then that we then we can, only then we'll have this methyl tetrahydrofolate and we need vitamin b12 only then there will be tetrahydrofolate so these two uh, vitamins are very important for dna maturation which in turn is involved in maturation of our precursor cells or progenitor cells okay so we will see more about that so folic acid which is obtained from the diet is absorbed from the intestine and gets converted to methyl tetrahydrofolate and then it is it is converted to active tetrahydrofolate with the help of vitamin b12 now this promotes the formation of deoxy thymidylate from deoxy uridylate for dna synthesis so this is the role of folic acid in erythropoiesis what about vitamin b12 vitamin b12 also is obtained from diet in the form of milk meat or liver it is synthesized in the bacterial flora in large intestine and it requires the intrinsic factor from stomach parietal cell so what is the role of intrinsic factor or what is the relationship between this intrinsic factor and vitamin b12 see inside our stomach so suppose this is the stomach we've got a parietal cells right the parietal cells secrete a, a factor known as the intrinsic factor so when uh, we've got vitamin b12 intrinsic factor will bind on to this vitamin b12 and they form a complex so vitamin b12 can travel only with the help of this intrinsic factor so like that this uh, vitamin b12 and intrinsic factor together they will reach up to the terminal ileum where vitamin b12 is absorbed now how is vitamin b12 absorbed see on this surface of the cell or, or on the uh, in the terminal part of ileum we've got a receptor known as tubulin so this vitamin b12 which was for in a complex with the intrinsic factor Uh, uh, attaches on to this tubulin and is then transported into the blood or absorbed into the blood inside the blood the vitamin b12 was transported in the form of transcobalamin it combines with transcobalamin and then forms a complex and thus is transported inside the blood so see this is how vitamin b12 reaches the blood so that is the role of intrinsic factor so if intrinsic factor is not there it will be difficult for absorption of vitamin b12 okay 
so that is why we said vitamin b12 requires the intrinsic factor from stomach's parietal cell they form a complex with intrinsic factor and is this absorbed into the ileum via cubulin it is transported with transcobalamin 2 and is finally stored in the liver so that is the role of vitamin b12 now vitamin b12 promotes conversion of methyl tetrahydrofolate to active tetrahydrofolate that is why whenever there is a deficiency of vitamin b12 there will be arrest of chromosomal division okay so here again we've got a physiological basis question why are the macrocytes in vitamin b12 or folic acid deficiency see we know as we said before vitamin b12 is necessary for dna synthesis in rbc precursors so if there is a deficiency there will be failure of nuclear maturation this in turn will hamper the cell division you know it is by mitosis that the cell size decreases so this mitosis or cell division is hampered which in turn will lead to formation of large immature cells called megaloblast that is why the deficiency is called megaloblastic anemia so thus in dietary factors we have seen the role of vitamin b12 and folic acid next we have to see the role of vitamin c what's the role of vitamin c it converts ferric ion to the ferrous form we know that for hemoglobin synthesis we need iron also so it is vitamin c which converts ferric to ferrous form and it facilitates the iron turnover which means the absorption of iron can take place properly only with the help of vitamin c so that is the role of the uh, vitamin c in arthropoiesis next we'll see the role of proteins so we know that hemoglobin contains a globin part also so there should be adequate amount of globin for synthesis of hemoglobin so that is the role of proteins in erythropoiesis next we'll move on to the minerals so the most important mineral is of course iron you know that iron is essential for synthesizing the heme component and thus the deficiency can cause iron deficiency anemia which is other uh, pathologically it is a hypochromic microcytic anemia the other uh, minerals that are important are copper and cobalt what is the role of copper it is necessary for absorption utilization of iron and it helps in incorporation of iron into the protoporphyrin ring during heme synthesis so in heme synthesis it is copper that helps in the incorporation of iron into the protoporphyrin ring what about cobalt cobalt is as a main ingredient of vitamin b12 we know that the scientific name of vitamin b12 is cyanocobalamin so cobalt is needed for vitamin b12 which in turn is required for erythropoiesis so that will complete our dietary factors now moving on to the other factors first we've got intrinsic factor which we have just discussed it is secreted from the oxyntic cells of the stomach or the parietal cells of the stomach along with hydrochloric acid and it helps in the absorption of vitamin b12 and its deficiency can cause megaloblastic anemia in environmental factors we've already discussed the role of hypoxia which is very important in stimulating erythropoietin production and it is one of the reason why in villages in high altitude have got increased rbc production so the, the same is the cause for individuals with cardiac and respiratory disease they have hypoxia which in turn will stimulate erythropoiesis and finally some drugs and chemicals so the most important drugs that can affect the erythropoiesis erythropoiesis is vasoconstrictor agents because vasoconstrictor agents can cause renal hypoxia which in turn can affect erythropoietin synthesis it can increase erythropoietin synthesis so that is how compounds like catecholamine cmp cyclic amp nad and nadp all can have a role in erythropoiesis so thus we have completed our factors affecting erythropoiesis of this i have to mention that vitamin b12 and folic acid are also called the special maturation factors so from this part the question can either be as a individual shortage of erythropoietin or the hormonal factors that affect erythropoiesis or maybe even as a dietary factors affecting erythropoiesis so now i hope i hope this concept is clear thank you